We are Spark, spiritually powerful and righteous kids. We are a family who believes we are deeply loved by God. Therefore, we strive to be people who accept others for who God made them to be. We will do this by welcoming, supporting, loving, and serving every person we meet. Amen. Now let's stand and worship God this morning. All right, y'all. Don't be afraid to sing along.
Come on, y'all. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Come on. All right, I think y'all got it. All right. taught us our father who are in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom, kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this At this time, we're going to collect our offering, which helps to support Rodeland, who's our friend who lives in Haiti. And I'll have Amisha is going to come around with the basket and collect our offering. You're encouraged, if you want to, to support uh, Rodeland to contribute a dollar from your allowance every week. Um, and that makes sure that she has, and she and her family have um, some basic needs met. Um, so just a fun fact, if everybody contributes their dollar um, twice a month, then we have more than enough for what we contribute to Rodeland every um, month. And then you know, sometimes we do give her family a little extra money for things like the holidays that are coming up or for her birthday and stuff like that. So especially as we're coming to the holidays, if you want to dig a little deeper in those pockets, that means that Rodeland, we can make a bigger gift to Rodeland and her family so that they have some extra special things for the holidays. So as we collect our offering, we're going to pray this prayer over what we have collected. God, Use our gifts to make earth look more like your kingdom. Amen. Amen. So a fun fact about Pastor Madeline is that growing up, I uh, was a dancer. I, I danced. I took ballet classes and tap and hip hop and all those things. Um, and it was something that I did from the time I was in first grade all the way until the time I graduated high school. And 
my mom was originally the one that kind of put me in dance class. I don't know that I looked at her and said, I want to go to do ballet. But once I had started it, I loved it. And it became my favorite thing. It was my hobby. It was something that was a really positive outlet for me when I was really stressed out, right? That I could um, perform and be in front of people. And I also really enjoyed, I have a lot of friends that I still talk to that I met over the years. But my very, one of my very first memories of ballet, I was like six or seven years old. And if you're familiar, dancers have very specific attire that they have to wear, especially for a ballet class. Like you have tights that you have to wear, and then you wear a leotard, and a leotard looks like a one-piece swimsuit. And then you have kind of this expectation that if you have long hair, you have to have your hair pulled back and up. And do you know how a lot of ballerinas wear their hair? What's it look like? There's a little bun on the back of their head, right? Well, I was, you know, in my little six-year-old self, in my little bun, in my little outfit, and I'm sure I looked real cute. But I re distinctly remember being in ballet class, and we were standing at the little bar, the little railing where we all do our little exercises, and this little girl turning around looking at me and going, you look like you have poop on your head. And I was mortified because she was talking about my bun because I have brown hair. And she's like, you have poop on your head? And I was like, no, I don't. I don't have poop on my head. That's my hair. But then a couple of other little girls started joining in. You have poop on your head. And next thing you know, there's this little sing song, you have poopy, poopy, poopy on your head, which... As an adult now, I look back and I can kind of like giggle about it because it's little kids being silly little kids. But as a six-year-old, mortifying, right? That all of a sudden, all these other kids in the class are looking at me and saying I have poop on my head because my mom put my bun a little too high up. Honestly, she really did. She didn't quite know how to do a bun just yet, so she put it like all the way up here instead of a little bit further back. And so I was mortified, embarrassed. I went back home. I did not tell my mom what happened, but the next time she went to go get me dressed for ballet class, do you think I wanted to go? No, absolutely I did not. And finally, she got out of me why I didn't want to go. It took me a long time to tell her. That is because the girls in the class told me I had poop on my head. And she, of course, probably was trying not to laugh while, you know, talking to me about this. But I, I ended up, you know, going back and I kept going to dance class. But it was the first time I can remember that's like seared in my brain from a young age, a moment where I was self-conscious about myself, right? About how I looked. Or I was also the first moment I can look back on and say, that was a moment where I didn't feel like I belonged, right? Because I knew I had to walk back into that classroom with all those little kids, and I didn't know what they were going to say the next time, right? And so I wonder if in this room you can kind of relate and maybe, and that's kind of a silly example, right, of being told you got poop on your head. But there are often times where we walk around in the world and we feel like we don't belong. And a lot of times we're made to feel that way by other people. You know, they make a comment about us and it's not cool, right? It doesn't feel good when people make us feel that way. And sometimes it's not even what people say, it's just you walk into a space and you look around, like maybe you've gone into a restaurant and you're wearing like your flip-flops and your athletic shorts and then you realize everybody else is wearing like collars and ties and you really are like, oh no, I do not fit in here. Like I don't feel like I, I belong in this place and you might get embarrassed and like walk out. So we all kind of know what that feeling is. And it's not a good feeling. And we all want to belong. And where you all are in your age, I look back on my, like, especially middle school, late elementary, and some of my high school years, and there are moments where I can really think about where, or years even, where I, I had friends, but I still just never really felt like I fit in, like I really belonged somewhere. Because when you think about what it means to belong, what, is that, what does that actually look like? Is it just that you're invited to participate? Or is it that you're uh, invited and appreciated for being there, right? And so I think belonging is more than just like having a place to be. Belonging is about that feeling we have of I can be myself and I can be appreciated and valued for who I am and people want me to be with them, right? And no matter, you know, if we're different, that people can see me and can value me and appreciate me and so I have a place, so today, we've been going through our series of we don't talk about that, right? And today, we're going to talk about belonging. And you might be thinking, Pastor Madeline, we talk about belonging in the church? Like, isn't that kind of a lot of the whole point of church? 
is that we talk about how God's love is for all of us and we want to all belong and have a place. So if you agree with me that the church should be a place where everyone finds belonging, right? Raise your hand. Is the church a place where everyone should feel like they belong? Not just like they're invited, but like they feel safe, they feel welcome, they feel appreciated and valued. They, we see you and we're like, yeah, I'm so excited you're here. Because I, I think that that's what church should be. But unfortunately, I think a lot of us have stories too that church is not always that place, right? Maybe we've experienced judgment from people who call themselves Christians. Maybe we've had even a pastor say something really harmful um, to us. Um, church isn't always the place where people find belonging, but it should be, right? And the challenge though is that when we say that and we all like, yeah, 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 church should be a place of belonging, we have to recognize that the church is not the building. I mean, this is a church, but when we're talking about the church, we're not talking about this space that we're all sitting in right now, and we're not talking about the hour that it is right now, you know, the, the service that we're sitting in. We're talking about ourselves. We are the church. Have you ever heard that before? That you are the church. And so if we want the church to be a place where everyone belongs, what does that mean about us? What does that mean for us? Who are we then supposed to be, right? If we want to be a place where everyone belongs, what does that look like? I think we do a good job of kind of giving some ideas of that in our community statement where we say we want to be a place that's welcoming and supporting, loving and serving. I think if we're doing all of those things well, then people feel like they belong and are valued, right? But the church hasn't always been that. And when we look out into our world, we can see all the many ways that people don't feel like they belong. I'm sure you can think of some examples right now as I'm talking about it. And unfortunately, it's been that way ever since the very, very, very beginning when God created human beings and God said they're good and they're in God's image and then there was Adam and Eve and then they had their children, Cain and Abel. Cain murdered his brother Abel because Abel gave a sacrifice to God and God kind of showed some preference for Abel's sacrifice. And so he couldn't handle the fact that God might be showing favoritism to Abel and so he killed him. And so this whole idea of other people having more attention or more value than us has been something that's been in part of human experience from the very, very beginning. We somehow, for some reason, can't allow other people to be who they are without feeling maybe a little bit of competitiveness in our own spirit. Like, I can't let you be good at that because what does that say about me? What if I'm not good at that, right? We always play that comparison game. And if you look throughout the history of human beings, we can see over and over these examples of that, right? We found ways to organize ourselves and say, well, this person is more important than that person because, well, they have a higher paying job. Or in history, we've said, well, certain people with certain colors of skin are more important than people with other colors of skin. Or we've said uh, in more recent times that if you love someone of the same gender, then you're somehow um, messed up in a way or broken or sinful. Um, or we've looked at people who have had disabilities and say, well, you have to work twice as hard as everybody else, not because of anything that you've done, but just because of something inherently with the way that you were born. Or we have kind of pushed out people who are refugees or immigrants who've been trying to come in and find safety. And we say, no, we don't have space for you here because you might take over stuff that we want. You see, we just constantly have to create these ways of separating ourselves from one another and saying that like my group is more important. And that's not what God calls us to, right? But we do it all the time. And so how do we push back against that? How do we get to the place where the church can really be a place where everyone finds belonging, where we as the people of God can be a safe place for every person to find the love of God? It's not an easy task, and we're not going to be perfect at it all the time. But I think it's definitely a very worthwhile task. Would you say amen to that? It's worth trying to become the people of God who allow everyone to be who they are and love them for who they are and who God made them to be, like we say every week in our community statement. And unfortunately, the church has played a role in not being good at that. And so it's our job now to say, no, we're going to do this differently. 
right? We're gonna be the people who love the way that Jesus intended because our scripture today comes from the story that you've probably heard if you've ever spent any time in church. You've probably heard this story because it's Jesus, one of his most famous parables, one of his most famous stories. And we're gonna, we're gonna look at it together. Um, it says that a legal expert stood up to test Jesus. So a legal expert, like a lawyer. And he said, teacher, what must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus replied, what is written in the law? How do you interpret it? And the man responded, you must love the Lord with your God, your God with all your heart, all your strength, all your being, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Anybody heard that before? Yeah. So this person asks, Jesus says to him, you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. But the legal expert wanted to prove that he was right. And so he said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? So Jesus answers this question with a story, which is what Jesus does. And so the, the man had been asking, basically, how do I love my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Who am I supposed to be loving? And so Jesus replies by saying, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he encountered thieves who stripped him naked, naked, beat him up and left him near death. And now it just so happened that a priest, do y'all know who a priest is? A religious leader, like a pastor, right? Was also going down the same road. And when he saw the injured man, he crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. He passed right by the man. Likewise, a Levite, also a religious leader, came by that spot, saw the injured man, and crossed over to the other side of the road and went on his way. But a Samaritan, who was on a journey, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. And the Samaritan went to him and bandaged his wounds, tending them with oil and wine, and he placed the wounded man on his own donkey and took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took two full days worth of wages and gave them to the innkeeper. And he said, take care of him. And when I return, I will pay you back for any additional costs. What do you think, Jesus says? Which one of these three was a neighbor to the man who encountered the thieves? And the legal expert said, the one who demonstrated mercy toward him. And Jesus tells him, go and do likewise. So... A little bit of backstory. Jesus telling this story to a group of, of folks who would have identified as Jewish or Israelites. They'd have been the people of God, kind of who he was talking to. And what you need to know is that they did not get along with this other group of people called the Samaritans. Did not agree. And the Samaritans were in another region of the country. So this is just kind of like somebody being like not a fan of somebody who lives in, say, Texas, right? So they're, they're part of the same like region, but they live somewhere else, right? And we don't get along with those people um, because we have all these stereotypes and judgments about them. But the main one is that we don't agree on where it is that we're supposed to worship God. The, the Israelite Jewish folks agree, agreed that we should worship God in Jerusalem, and the Samaritans thought that they should worship God on a specific mountain. And so that was like the reason why they didn't get along. So for Jesus to say the person who was a good neighbor, the person who lived out the commandments to love your neighbor as yourself was a Samaritan, was a super offensive thing for him to say to the Jewish folk. Because there's like saying one of your enemies or one of those people that you really don't like is the person that knows how to love people well. And so that's a, a, just a thing to file away, you know, a fact to file away in our brain as we think about what it means to be people who help others to belong, right? That Jesus uses the very people that we would say are like our enemies or our opposites to prove to us what it means to love another person. It's kind of a mind warp when we really sit with it. But there's a couple things that I think we can learn from this story. So if we go back to our original question, if we believe this, that the church should be a place where everyone finds belonging, and we ask the question, if we are the church, how do we do that? The Samaritan teaches us a few things in this story. The first thing he teaches us is that if we are going to be a place where people find belonging, we need to be willing to be inconvenienced. That's a big word for saying we ought to be willing to stop doing what we're doing and help somebody else instead. Because as we see in the story, there's two other people that walk by the road and they see the man injured and they walk on the opposite side of the road as him, just kind of like walk around, right? 
And it, they could have some legitimate reasons, you know? It could be 10.45 and church starts at 11 and they got to get there because they're preaching and everybody's going to be waiting for them. But they don't stop for the man who's injured. The Samaritan probably also has things going on about his day. He's on a journey. And he allows his day to be disrupted in order to help this man. And so for us, when we're going about our day-to-day -day life, and we see other people who look like they might need some love, care, attention, look like they're all on their own, look like they don't have any friends, look like they're new here and are still trying to figure out how things work, we have to be willing to kind of put our schedule aside and to interact with them in order to help them feel like they belong, right? If you've ever been in a new place, I know there have been times where I've been at like, parties or, I don't know, events or um, coming to a new school or coming to a new person's house and I don't really know people, there's that like awkward few moments where you're like, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to sit, I don't know what to do. Anybody else have that feeling of like in a new place, you're like, what do I do? And you kind of get a little anxious about like, I don't know anybody here, I don't know who to talk to. And then, at least in my experience, there's been somebody who's brave enough to walk up to you and say, hi, I'm Nevea. nice to meet you. Um, how do you know Mr. Blake? I know Mr. Blake because we work together and then we have a conversation and all of a sudden there's like this relief that comes, you know, when somebody comes and finally talks to you. So you're not by yourself, you now have somebody and then you kind of might chat with them and then you kind of walk around and maybe they introduce you to somebody else. That is what we're called to do, is to be willing to be inconvenienced. Be willing to, if you're at youth group and you and your best friend haven't had a chance to talk all week, but you look over and you see that Gage is sitting by himself and has nobody to talk to or it doesn't have a partner for the game, you say, hey Gage, I'm gonna come hang out with you instead. Even though it means you don't get to talk to your friend like you hoped you could. Does that make sense? Being people who create space for other people to belong means that sometimes we have to be inconvenienced. We have to put our own needs and wants and hopes and wishes to the side for just a little bit of time to welcome somebody else in. The second thing that the Samaritan teaches us is that we have to notice and respond. And that kind of goes hand in hand with being willing to be inconvenienced, right? We see that somebody needs help, we notice it, and then we gotta step in and do something about it, right? The man sees the, the, the Samaritan, sees the man on the side of the road and he not recognizes he's injured. And so he provides first aid. And then he takes him into the inn and helps him to have what he needs there, right? So if we see somebody, who doesn't have a partner for a game or somebody who doesn't have some to place to sit at lunchtime or doesn't have um, and somebody to encourage them while they're crying, we notice it and then we do something about it instead of being like the Levite or the priest that just like walk away like, oh, somebody else will take care of it, right? We notice and we respond and that's how we help people to feel like they belong. And I think that's something that can be really hard is that, especially in our world, there are lots of people who are hurting, you know? And it's not always a visible hurting. We have to be willing to notice um, how they're interacting with the people around them, right? And this noticing and responding kind of also gets into bullying, which I know happens a lot in, amongst the communities of folks your age, is noticing and actually being the person to say, hey, that's not cool. You know, and that takes courage to be that person to stand up and say, hey, that comment that you made about somebody's, uh, the way they looked or the way they acted or just in general about their personality, that's not cool. And I actually really appreciate this person. And so I don't want you to continue to talk about them that way. I wonder how that would have changed my little silly interaction when I, everybody was telling me I looked like I had a pile of poo on my head, right? If one of the other girls had said, no, she doesn't. We're going to do our ballet exercises now, right? how that would have probably brought me some relief and made it not so bad, you know? So when we are helping other people to belong, we need to notice these things and we need to be willing to respond. And the last thing that the Samaritan does is he actually follows through. Meaning, like I said at the very beginning, belonging isn't just about inviting people, it's about actually building relationships with them, right? So I can say, oh yeah, come on over and sit with me at lunch, and I sit with you at lunch that one day, and then I never talk to you ever again. That doesn't make somebody feel like they belong, right? It's got to be this kind of ongoing thing where there's this follow-through. 
And the Samaritan does that because he provides care for the person on the side of the road. He takes him to the inn and continues to take care of him for the rest of the day. And then the next morning, he talks to the innkeeper and says, hey, I gotta go like do whatever I was doing, but I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna make sure that if there's anything else that you're owed, I'm gonna pay for it. And if the man is still here, he probably would see him again, right? So the, the Samaritan follows through on his actions of noticing and responding and acting in love for the man that's hurting. And so for us, these are some tips of how we can be those people who help others to belong, right? Because we all want a place to belong. And I'm wearing my Samaritan shirt today, not only because we're talking about the Good Samaritan, so it makes sense. Also, Miss Betty and Mr. Blake and I did not plan this, and all three of us showed up to work today wearing these shirts. <laughs> just a weird Holy Spirit thing, you know? Um, and they didn't even know I was using the Good Samaritan passage. They just showed up randomly today wearing the same shirt as me. But I, we made these shirts for a mission trip years ago, and it was over Martin Luther King weekend because Martin Luther King, the night, the day before he was assassinated, gave a, a speech, a, a, a a sermon, if you aren't familiar, Martin Luther King was a Baptist minister, and he gave a sermon and he talked about this story of the Good Samaritan in his very last speech he ever gave. And I always think about this question that Martin Luther King brought out in his speech when I think about what it means to be the church and to help take care of people and to make sure that all people feel like they belong. And he says that the first two people, the priest and the Levite, who walked by the Samaritan man and didn't provide him help, were asking themselves the question, if I stop and help him, what's gonna happen to me? That's the question that was in their minds. If I stop and help the Samaritan man, then I'm gonna be late to church. If I stop and help the Samaritan man, then ritually I'm gonna be unclean and I can't even go to church, that was true. If I stop and help this man, I'm gonna... Um, maybe even also get hurt because somebody clearly beat this man up and so I don't know if they're still waiting around to also hurt me, right? So they're thinking more about their own selves, right? What's gonna happen to me if I stop and take care of this? Well, Martin Luther King says, the question the Samaritan asked when he walked by was if I don't help this man, what will happen to him? If I don't stop and help this man, what will happen to him? And I think that that's a great question for all of us to consider. When we see people in our world who are hurting, when we see people who are being bullied, when we see people who are by themselves, when we see people who just are genuinely feeling like they don't belong, if we don't step in and show care and love and compassion, what will happen to them? Because we all know what that feels like to not feel like we belong and how low that can kind of bring you and how that can impact your self-esteem and how it can impact your mental health and all those kinds of things. And so if we ask ourselves that question during the day, instead of saying, what's gonna happen to me if I stop? What's gonna happen for them if I do? And so that's our challenge always. This isn't just a challenge for the week or the day. If we fully believe that the church to be a place where everyone finds belonging, then that means it's our responsibility every day to be willing to stop, to be noticing and responding, and to be willing to follow through and to ask that question, if I don't help, who is? And Jesus wraps up this story by asking the legal expert, who is the one who is the good neighbor? And the man responds, the one who has compassion. And so that's our challenge always, is to be people who have compassion. Do we think we can rise to that occasion? Can we do it here in our community? Can we? Yes. I hope we can, because I want this to be a place where all of the kids who ever come in here ever feel like they belong. And not just that they have a place to sit, but that they have people who care about them and want them here. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks that you are a good God whose love is overflowing, immeasurable, it's so big, that we know that your love for us is the same for the person next to us and the person behind us and the person in front of us. And that that love is not made lesser because of their presence in our life. God, that there's enough love to go all around for every single person 
on this earth. And God, I pray a special blessing over people today who feel like they don't belong, who feel like there's not a place for them, who feel like they are undervalued, who feel like they're not appreciated, God, who struggle with connecting with others. And God, I pray that we can be people who see and notice and respond, and that we can truly live into what it means to love our neighbors the way that you've taught us to. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you would like to during this next song, you're welcome to come up to the altar rails and pray. There are um, little yellow baskets over here with pieces of paper and writing utensils. You can write a prayer request down if you would like to do that. And then we have a prayer wall over here where if you write a prayer request and you tuck it in the ribbons, then Miss Betty, Mr. Blake, and I will read it this week and pray for you. If you want it to stay just between you and God, you can push it behind these ribbons and there's a hollow spot where it'll stay anonymous. So that's an option for you this morning if you would like to do that. As always, if you would like for me to pray with you, you're welcome to come and let me know that and we can pray together. But let's spend some time thinking about what it means to be people who make space for others.
any other part. everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes, be prepared to pray with us. Dear Lord, thank you for everything you've done for us in the past, in the present, in the, in the future, Lord. Lord, we thank you for waking us up this morning and give us another day to come to church and praise your name, Lord. Lord, we thank you for everything you've done for us and anything that you will do for us in anything you are doing for us, Lord. Lord, at this moment, we ask you to put yourself in our hearts and forgive us for our sins, Lord. Lord, we ask that you take care of each and every one of us because we all need you, Lord. You're the one and only Savior, Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together we say, amen. amen.